My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. Welcome to another episode. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy our coverage as always. And we appreciate you continuing to listen, like our podcast, download, rate, and review, and all of that. And if we sound relaxed and happy, it's because we're admiring our Christmas trees in our respective locations. Yes, Mr. Thomas has a beautiful tree in his beautiful library in his beautiful house in Norfolk, Connecticut. Are we sensing a theme here? <laughs> I understand that you have a beautiful tree in your living room in yes, your I do. beautiful house in Williamsburg, Virginia. I'm very thrilled by this tree. I got it on massive sale last year. It's seven and a half feet tall and it's gorgeous. Our tree is covered with flock. It's sort of this white snow stuff. And Pamela swears every year that she wants to get rid of the tree, which is actually quite beautiful. It is. Because when you take it out of the box, the stuff goes everywhere. Mm -hmm. And then Oliver, the dog, ended up covered with the stuff. Ah, which is, I'm sure, made of some petrochemical or another. <laughs> and <laughs> every year she says, we're going to get rid of this tree and we're going to get a new artificial Christmas tree. Mm-hmm. And then when we're in stores where they have such things, you know, they're $200 or something crazy. And they're a lot. I, I usually say something like, don't you think we can get another year out of that great looking Christmas tree? <laughs> As I explained to her the other day when we were setting up the tree and she did most of the work, I just did the heavy lifting. You put the Christmas tree out and then you vacuum up the, <laughs> all the stuff from the rug. Mm-hmm. And then she actually wanted to try vacuuming the dog. And I said, I thought that was a bad idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Oliver would appreciate that. No, she actually had the hose attachment off yeah. and she was kind of approaching. And I said, this is going to give Oliver nightmares for years, if you try yes. to vacuum the long-haired dachshund with the hose attachment, he is not going to be happy. Yeah, I would think not. Yeah, Ziggy it's... has not tried to knock over the tree yet. Well, that's his job, though. He'll get to it. He he won't, though, actually. He's really good about that. But what he will do is he will nibble the branches, the fake branches. Mm, yeah. And so at least once during the Christmas season, I will come home to little piles of kitty barf that have pine tree needles wow. in it from the fake tree that's hard that i have to clean up it's awful it's awful you yeah. think he would sort of get it after a while like this is not good and doesn't make me feel good and it's selective memory on his part because he does it every single year i don't know cats are weird when it comes to the tree he likes to lay under it and look up at the lights but he also likes to chew on it and make himself ill so Mm -hmm. i don't know he's a very weird cat anyway a little bit of lack of long-term thinking on (laughs) ziggy's part i think yes yes that is true but we do hope that on this very first day of december everybody is gearing up to celebrate the holidays and if you haven't already please check out our true crime holiday gift guide compiled lovingly by both of us to uh, help you with your holiday shopping for the true crime lover in your life absolutely happy holidays everybody It's almost here. And we were recording this on Wednesday afternoon, December 1st. Wednesday afternoon, December 1st, which also, by the way, does make some of what we are talking about slightly dated by the time this Uh, is released. Only a little, maybe. Only a little, but we do feel like we need to let everybody know that we are recording this on Wednesday, December 1st. And by the time you hear it next week, there may be some additional news that needs to be updated. So we're just going to give you what we've got as of right now, Wednesday, December 1st, and we'll update as needed. It's only fresh the day you put it in the can. (laughs) (laughs) I think I've just developed a truism there. (laughs) Where did you get that from? I just made it up. (laughs) 
I think. Well, there you go. The wit and wisdom of Bill Thomas, everybody. It's only fresh the day you put it in the can. Wow, we're going to have to remember that. Maybe even write it down. You're going to have to write it down because that actually makes sense. <laughs> it really does. What we're talking about in terms of news, both fresh and stale, <laughs> is uh, this is actually by listener request. We've had a couple of listeners ask, are you guys going to cover the Ghislaine Maxwell trial? And we thought about it for a couple of minutes and said, yeah. How, how could we not, really? How could we not, really? Uh, you know, Jeffrey Epstein was uh, definitely a story that we followed, some of us with more nausea than others. Mm, and uh, hard not to. The two of them, it, I, I think, eesh. I, I want to yeah. wash my hands after I finish doing research to get ready for this podcast. Yeah, exactly. This is a story that is uh, revolting in a lot of ways and, uh, you know, nauseating and infuriating, but it, it is something that is sure to make waves. So we figured we would go ahead and run a little coverage about the Ghislaine Maxwell trial for our lovely listeners out there. So thank you to the listeners who asked us to cover the trial. This is for you. Great. Pardon me while I, well, I, I did just wash my hands, so I think we're good. <laughs> I, know. I think we're good too. Try not to make like Ziggy and Hurl during the course of this <laughs> reporting. Yeah, seriously. There were definitely times during this research that I, I felt sick to my stomach. So we're going to offer the reporting here from a couple of sources. And so I do want to acknowledge a great debt to the folks at the New York Intelligencer for some of the background information offered on Ghislaine Maxwell here, because this is more research than we would have been able to do. Shout out to the folks at New York Intelligencer. They did some great work here. For those of you guys who are following the trial, the actual name of the trial, if you want to get fancy, is USA versus Ghislaine Maxwell. And the trial is being held at the Thurgood Marshall U.S. Courthouse in Manhattan, and it is expected to last about six weeks. And when we're recording this, we are two days into the trial. So we've got a great big, long slog of coverage ahead of us. This trial, depending on what they do with Christmas breaks and stuff like that, this could easily stretch into early next year. Oh, yeah. Ghislaine Maxwell, for those of you who may need a bit of a refresher, is the... Someone described her as the major domo of Jeffrey Epstein. And I, I think that actually, it fits. She was arrested in New Hampshire. And Bill, you told me the name of the place in New Hampshire, and now I can't remember it. It's Bradford, New Hampshire, which is up in the boonies. Up in the boonies. You heard it here first. She was arrested on July 2nd, 2020, the year that never felt like it was going to end. She was at her private gated 156 acre estate, which she conveniently bought in cash after Jeffrey Epstein's death in 2019. You know, people talked, oh, where, where is she hiding? Where in, the, where in mm -hmm. the globe could she possibly be with all of her money and all of her contacts? She was up in the boonies in New Hampshire. That's where she was. She was not hiding or, or globe trotting or anything like that. She was in New Hampshire. According to the reporting, though, she did keep a very low profile while she was yes. up there. People had seen a dark haired woman, but not very much. And yeah. so apparently they had food delivered in and staff to take care of things. She didn't leave the premises. She was definitely laying low in this beautiful kind of isolated location up in northern New Hampshire. And it is the understanding that she was ultimately traced to her property via that cell phone signal, that pesky cell phone signal that'll get you into trouble every time. That is ultimately how the FBI came to find her location and then duly went in and arrested her. That part actually shocks me because you'd think maybe getting a new cell phone or a burner. I mean, I'm not an expert on all things criminal, but this doesn't seem like a particularly smart move. No, I, I don't think it is either. But I also wonder if you maybe tend to get more careless the more money that you have at your disposal. I, I don't know. Depends on whether or not you want to end up in jail. <laughs> I guess so. So Ghislaine Maxwell was arrested in New Hampshire, and she is currently being held in the Metropolitan Detention Center in beautiful Sunset Park. And she has been there since her arrest. She is being kept in isolation. 
As we all know, her partner, Jeffrey Epstein, may or may not have committed suicide. There is There was that whole run of conspiracy theories about did he or did he not kill himself? We'll get into that later. It, yes, but to make sure that she does not suffer the same fate, whether that fate was killing herself or having someone kill her, uh, she's checked on every 15 minutes so that she does not ultimately end up like Epstein. She is currently being held and is awaiting trial, which just started on eight federal charges. I'm going to go ahead and list out those charges for you so that we're clear. The eight federal charges pending against Ghislaine Maxwell are enticing a minor to travel to engage in illegal sex acts, transporting a minor with the intent to engage in criminal sexual activity, conspiracy charges related to both of those previous charges, sex trafficking of a minor, and sex trafficking conspiracy. There are two charges of perjury against her for lying under oath when she was questioned about Jeffrey Epstein, but those two charges are going to be addressed in a separate trial as opposed to this trial. This one deals with the actual sex trafficking and criminal sexual activity. So the perjury thing is going to be a whole separate trial a little bit later on. Does not sound all that great for Ghislaine Maxwell. No, the whole thing gives me the heebie-jeebies. It really, really, really does. A lot of people have wondered how exactly she knew Jeffrey Epstein. And there are some areas where you do still have some questions. There are gaps in time where she, you know, was with Epstein for a little bit, then she wasn't. But the basic background on how Ghislaine Maxwell knew Jeffrey Epstein is pretty much this. She may have known him about as early as 1988 through her father, who was a billionaire businessman. She absolutely knew him by 1992. That was when they were seen boarding the Concorde together. We know that she did date him. We know that she you know, filled the role of making sure that everything in his life ran smoothly, especially when he was traveling between houses. And he did have multiple properties. Worth noting, she's the daughter of Robert Maxwell, who's a billionaire financier who died via drowning mm -hmm. off his yacht. Um, so he died under somewhat mysterious circumstances. She has inherited his pretty vast fortune as a result of his untimely death. I feel like there's the potential for a mini series in there somewhere oh, dealing with just so this family. There's so stuff. much potential here. This family's drama uh, just outside of Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein. There's a ton of it. So we do know that she began, this phrase just, it's awful. She began providing him with young girls around 1994. She started gaining access to them by leaving her calling cards at spas and chatting with people in malls. She would find girls that she thought were palatable to Mr. Epstein. I feel like I shouldn't even call him Mr. Honestly, I don't think he deserves it. Um, I know. <laughs> she found girls that Epstein uh, would have found interesting and enticing. She took them shopping. She took them out to the movies. She befriended them. When she would take them to Epstein's house, she encouraged them to accept money from him, cash, of course. She was also present when Epstein had sex with them, abused them. I don't think there's much of a line there. I think it's probably abuse more than anything else. Just so we're clear, some of these girls were as young as 14 years old. He liked them young, and Maxwell would groom these young women. They looked for young women that were from broken homes, product of divorce, latchkey kids, young girls without a lot of supervision. She would identify attractive young girls and then look for opportunities to exploit their vulnerabilities. These are, you know, we can't call them women because they're not even women at this no, point. No, they're not. They're definitely girls. And she would look for these young girls who were very attractive, but not very sure of themselves and were sort of from often just outright poor or lower middle class backgrounds who would be very interested in being showered with attention, gifts and clothing and take them to 
the movies and, and to tea and mm-hmm. kind of show them another more glamorous way of living that was very appealing to these young girls. Yeah, and a lot of that we're going to get into more specifically in a couple of minutes when we talk about trial testimony that was offered yesterday by a woman who wished only to be known as Jane. Mm. And we'll get into that in just a couple of minutes. We know that Ghislaine Maxwell worked for Epstein officially from 1999 to 2006, obtaining girls and getting them to him and to his various friends. And we'll talk about affiliations here in a minute. The reporting says that during that 1999 to 2006 timeframe, she was also giving TED Talks, speaking to the UN. I'm really not entirely sure what she would have to speak to the UN about. There was nothing specific in the reporting. What's she going to talk about? Procuring uh, international (laughs) travel? Sex trafficking? I I don't know. It's, I I can't think of anything potentially useful that she would have to offer either in a TED talk or to the UN. Like I, I don't, I don't know. We do have some, some business issues that we're going to get into in a second involving her and her husband that she also was involved with. Everything that I look at about this woman's background is just It just kind of makes me shake my head and go, you could do so many things with your life and your money and you chose to do this. Yeah, it's pretty off-putting to put it mildly. Here's a woman who has every privilege, inherited wealth, beauty. She's a very attractive woman. And yet this is how she chooses to spend her life. And it sounds like Maxwell and Epstein, their relationship started as a romantic one and then ultimately almost becomes like a business partnership to help him and his low-life friends secure sex with underage girls. Yeah, that's, that's about what it sounds like. We know the FBI started officially investigating Epstein in 2006 for sexual assault and trafficking minors. And that's a whole separate side issue that we'll get into in a little bit about Epstein and what he was being investigated for in the timeline on that. There is an unaccounted for period between 2006 and 2012 where we don't really know what Ghislaine Maxwell was doing. But from 2012 to 2019, Ghislaine Maxwell was listed as the chief executive of a pro ocean nonprofit called the Terramar Project, which the, the reporter was gleeful enough to note that the Terramar Project, this pro ocean nonprofit, has no offices and it gave no grants to other projects. So it really doesn't seem likely that the Terramar Project is anything other than like a shell corporation. The expression tax dodge comes to mind. <laughs> That's probably more, more what it is, yeah. In 2013, she met Scott Borgerson. The reporting on this was so interesting. Apparently, he's her husband, except at various times, both of them renounced each other as being married to each other. There is no marriage license or marriage certificate on file for them. It's very, very odd. So let me kind of go down this weirdly complex personal life that she has. I sat and read the reporting on it. I shook my head and said, what is, what is this? What is going on here? In 2013, Ghislaine Maxwell met Scott Borgerson, 14 years younger than she is. They dated They married in 2016, and this was after he divorced his previous wife the year prior. Scott Borgerson is a former Coast Guard captain. He is a former CEO of Cargo Metrics, which is a marine analysis company that tracks ocean supply chains. When Ghislaine Maxwell was arrested in 2020, she at first denied being married to her husband. Then she changed her mind and said, actually, she was in the process of divorcing him. But then he turned around and said, yeah, I'm not married to her. And in fact, he went even further and said, I'm not even dating her. She's not even living with me in our house in Manchester where we've been living together. She's not even anything to me. She's just a former friend. He actually called her a former friend. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back. After this word from our sponsors. 
Many of you know that Authram is leading the way in DNA testing, helping law enforcement solve missing persons, homicides, and sexual assault cases across the United States and Canada using forensic-grade DNA tests. You can help this important cause by contributing funds and your DNA profile to Authram's free site, dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just choose simple steps. Now DNA Solves has added another new feature, DNA Solves Connect, which will allow you to upload your DNA profile to help law enforcement, even if you've never used one of the commercial genealogy sites. If you're looking for a missing family member or have lost touch with someone, DNA Solves Connect is an incredible option at only $14.95. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. Join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Authram and dnasolves.com. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. So we don't really know what the deal is with Ghislaine Maxwell and her husband. He's listed as her husband on court documents, but there's no marriage license. And at various times, they've both said, no, I'm not married to that person. The expression tax dodge comes to mind again. (laughs) (laughs) This has something to do with their perhaps trying to shield one another from liability or something. There's something not right about this. And then, of course, with all of her international travel and multiple citizenships, they could have gotten married elsewhere in the world. I was very interested to note that they both filed taxes as single in 2018. Strikes me as maybe legit if the IRS and your accountant are willing to sign off on it. There was also the question of the money and how much she has. Other than definitely a lot, there are some conflicting numbers, and some of those numbers have to do with the husband or the not-husband. He's Schrodinger's husband. We don't know if he (laughs) is or isn't. (laughs) He's a non-husband. He's the non-husband husband. When she was arrested in July, she said she had $3.5 million. And I think that's BS considering that she sold her townhouse in New York for $15 million, but that's okay. Later that year, in court filings, she said she had $22.5 million in assets with her husband, who's also not her husband, who she filed taxes singly away from. Both those figures are absurdly low. Her father was a billionaire who drowned under mysterious circumstances. She is hoarding money in offshore accounts to hide them and protect them from taxation. According to the prosecution, she has at least 15 bank accounts in different countries. Mm -hmm. They did say that they have seen millions of dollars disappearing from and then being returned to accounts associated with both Ghislaine Maxwell and Jeffrey Epstein. When I was researching Jeffrey Epstein, and we'll get into his information as we move forward here, he was hiding money all over the world, especially in places like the United States Virgin Islands, which is a tax haven and a place where many, many billionaires hide assets because it is outside the reach of the United States, but is part of the United States banking system. So it's easy to move money in and out of the Virgin Islands without tripping the wires that would inform the IRS that there are taxable events taking place. Well, because she has access to that kind of money, when she applied for bail, and she's applied for it four times, most recently November 9th, she's been denied bail. The judge considers her a flight risk for two reasons. Number one, she has foreign citizenships in definitely the UK and France, maybe others, and she has all that money. No one knows how much. The judge described her finances as being opaque which I think is understating it by a mile. I guess Ghislaine Maxwell was so desperate to get bail that she offered to renounce her foreign citizenships. She offered to have someone supervise her money. But the judge basically said, yeah, no, we're not letting you out on bail. You're a flight risk. She has an extraordinary capability to evade detection. 
her renouncing her citizenship, I don't buy that, not for a second. She probably has multiple passports under multiple names, as did Jeffrey Epstein. I'm sorry, none of this washes. No, none of it does. Prior to her arrest in New Hampshire, she had been living in a little, I was going to describe it as a hamlet, but I don't think it's a hamlet. It's a little place called Manchester by the Sea in Massachusetts. Are you familiar with that, Mr. I Thomas? I am, Manchester by the Sea. How shall I describe it? It's a seaside hamlet. It's oh, I was right with hamlet. Go me. Absolutely beautiful. It's like a little charming seaside village. There are uh, some fishing boats and that sort of thing, but it's one of those places, it's kind of off the beaten path up north of Boston on the water. Absolutely gorgeous. There are working class people there and and fisher folk and people like that, but there's also a lot of money in fancy houses behind big, thick hedges overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. It's a beautiful place. It does sound like the kind of place that she and her husband, not husband, Scott Borgerson would have wanted to retire to because they did leave New York after she sold her townhouse for $15 million and moved up to Manchester by the sea. And she was there with her husband, not husband, and stepkids starting in 2016. And then when everything went down with Epstein, she moved up to Bradford, New Hampshire. That townhouse that she sold, according to my research, is the same townhouse that was purchased for her for $4.9 million some years ago by an anonymous gift. So now let's take a minute and go into the trial testimony from yesterday. And when we say yesterday, we mean Tuesday, the 30th of November. And we'd like to acknowledge reporting from Newsweek and the New York Post for information about this trial testimony. All of this turned my stomach. I'm not going to lie. I feel extraordinarily bad for this woman. And uh, I think she shows great bravery in being able to stand up and talk about this on the stand. It really is terrible. I think our disdain for Maxwell is probably pretty obvious at this point. This testimony is actually pretty difficult sledding. So, Yesterday, Tuesday, November 30th, was the first day of testimony from Jane. Jane is not her real name. It is a pseudonym that she is using to protect her. She has had a acting career that spans over 20 years. She is in her early 40s, and she would like to maintain the integrity of her acting career. So she asked to give her testimony under a pseudonym. So that pseudonym is Jane. Jane is described as being the first of four women who have been described as key accusers for this trial. The charge to which she is speaking is the charge of grooming and then sexually abusing young women. Jane got up on the stand and reported that she had sexual encounters with Jeffrey Epstein from the years of 1994 to 1997. And in 1994, she was 14 years old. She was between seventh and eighth grade. She stated that she met both Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell at a music camp in 1994. She was at that music camp because she wanted to pursue a singing career. And she was introduced to Epstein and Maxwell and was told that they are benefactors who gave scholarships to musically gifted kids, which probably, I'm sure on the surface, sounded pretty okay. You know, there are adults who do give scholarships to gifted kids, and not all of them, or not even most of them, are pedophiles. And unfortunately, she happened to meet Epstein and Maxwell, and they were predators. She described a pattern of behavior of both Epstein and Maxwell befriending her, as well as her mother, so that mom would allow them to spend time with her. They were invited over for tea at Jeffrey Epstein's house. And after, I assume, getting the okay from her mom to spend time with them, Maxwell and Epstein started taking this young woman out for shopping trips. She said that they regularly gave her money on her visits to the house. They bought her clothes. They bought her things for school. 
Those clothes eventually began to include trips to Victoria's Secret for underwear, which sends ugh, vibes down my spine. They even began paying for voice lessons so that she could embark on that singing career that she wanted. And so she described spending time at Epstein's home. She said she was there every week or every two weeks. She said she hung out by the pool. She would hang out with them in the kitchen. They would watch movies. And she described, uh, she said, initially, I felt special, but it changed when the abuse started happening. Epstein took her to the pool house in his Palm Beach home and pleasured himself in front of her. She said that Ghislaine Maxwell taught her how to give Epstein sexual massages and then participated in those encounters by giving them to him herself and then showing the girls how to do it as well. She described threesomes between Jane and Maxwell and Epstein. She reported that many times Epstein and Maxwell were giggling as they participated and then encouraged her to participate as well. She described scenes that she said felt more like an orgy than anything else. And this is all with a 14 <laughs> and 15 year old girl. Uh, it's making my stomach turn. This oh. is awful. She said that Maxwell would often come into the room when Jane and Epstein were having sex and she acted very casual as if it was no big deal that it was a 14 year old girl, eventually 15, having sex with a grown man. When asked how many times Ghislaine Maxwell was in the room, she said, it's hard to remember because I was abused pretty much every time I would go over to the house. And it all started to seem the same after a while. The whole thing. Uh, yeah, that really is. That's the gist of the testimony. There is a whole lot more. That's about as much as I could stomach reporting out. And that's hard to do. There are no words for what a monstrous pair these two are. There's been a significant amount of discussion about the fact that there are no cameras allowed in this courtroom for these proceedings, mm -hmm. nor is there any television coverage allowed that shows the interior of the courtroom. And this has resulted, here we go again, in all sorts of conspiracy theories about why the Maxwell trial is not being televised. The reason is actually quite straightforward. Federal charges, which is what Maxwell has been brought up on, are not televised. That is, courtroom proceedings for federal charges are never televised. We've all gotten used to a certain degree of cameras in the courtroom, but those are at the state and local level. As you mentioned at the top, Kristen, this case is the United States of America versus Jelaine Maxwell. The federal government is in charge of this prosecution, therefore no cameras. So there's nothing special about this treatment. There's nothing unusual or conspiratorial about the fact that there are no cameras in this courtroom. That is routine. But of course, everybody seems to be ignoring that and waving their hands in the air, insisting that Maxwell is getting special treatment, which she is not. It was refreshing to hear in some of the reporting that she has not received special treatment in detention either. In fact, she and her lawyer have filed a litany of complaints about the conditions under which she's being held. And I'm glad to hear that she is so miserable because she deserves to be. There's nothing special about her. She should be treated just like any other prisoner. Applying for bail four times. Good luck with that. That went nowhere. Yeah. And so she's going home to jail every single night while she's undergoing trial. Couldn't happen to a nicer person, honestly. Absolutely awful. That is the most recent happenings in the Ghislaine Maxwell trial as of Wednesday, December the 1st. Now, by the time this episode airs, more will have happened, but we will continue our coverage on the Ghislaine Maxwell trial as well as giving you some information about Jeffrey Epstein and his slime ball existence before he committed suicide. And I don't know if we should put quotation marks around that or not in 2019. Next time on Mind Over Murder, we'll be talking about Jeffrey Epstein and the backstory of his relationship with Jelaine Maxwell. Epstein, who's well known at this point, was a financial advisor and fraudster 
who died in police custody on August 10th, 2019, while awaiting trial on numerous charges of having sex with underage girls. Again, federal charges. It was going to be a very interesting trial, and there's a lot of question about the circumstances of his initial prosecution at the state level, as Mm -hmm. well as what happened when the FBI stepped in. It's a quite a twisted and sordid tale in and of itself. And of course, Epstein, through his suicide or murder, and we'll get into that next time, has escaped justice, at least in this world. And Maxwell now becomes the primary focus of the victims of Jeffrey Epstein and Jelaine Maxwell, who could number in the hundreds the Miami Herald's reporting by Julie Brown. She did a spectacular series of articles, which we'll link to in our show notes. She identified at least 80 victims and located 60 of them. It's just baffling. It, it's it's just mind boggling, really, and very infuriating, nauseating, you name it. There's probably an adjective for it that I haven't thought of yet. Th- this is just awful. There are any number of different books out at the moment about the Jeffrey Epstein case. So if you do need to do a little bit of catch up because you just can't wait for our episode, there's plenty out there. Just hit your local true crime section. That's going to do it for this episode of Mind Over Murder. Thank you so much for listening. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.